Hi listeners, welcome to another episode of Worlds Collide, the podcast about moving abroad. I'm your host Victoria and first I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in today. Okay, so before we start, I just wanted to mention that if you are a frequent listener on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would be super awesome from you if you give my podcast a five-star rating because that would help immensely to be better recognized. Also, don't forget to push the follow button in the corner of your app and then you will always see when a new episode is coming out and you won't miss any. That is so great, isn't it? Okay, so enough of that. <laughs> And I want to do a brief introduction of today's episode. So my guest is Linda and she and her family, they lived abroad for 26 years. Oh, that's a long time. And she and her husband just moved back a year ago to the United States. And so we have an honest conversation about how it has been the good and the bad, but mostly honest. So yeah, here's Linda. So my guest today is Linda. Hi, Linda. How are you? Hello, Victoria. So nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. So where are you calling from? Right now I'm in Annapolis, Maryland, a uh, house sitting for my, my brother-in-law who's from Germany. Ah, okay. <laughs> See? <laughs> nice. Nice coincidence. Yeah. But, but you just moved back to the United States, right? Not too long ago? No, uh, actually a year ago yesterday. Oh, okay. Wow, that's an anniversary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, somehow it's managed to be like just the time has just dragged and also flown by at the same time. I don't know how uh -huh. by physics. I don't know how that's even possible. <laughs> yeah, it's like sometimes some days feel just like very long and then others just go by. Or like then the total was like, oh. That yeah. was just six months ago. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so where did you move back from? I moved back from Japan. My husband and I had lived in Japan for um, altogether 26 years. Wow, that's a long time. Mm. Okay, so let's start then in the beginning. Um, what brought you to Japan? Well, I moved away from the United States when I was in my 20s. And I traveled around a bit and then I had given, I had quit university because I at that time hadn't known what I was doing. And then mm -hmm. when I turned 30, I'm like, oh, I think I know what I want to do. So I went back to school, met my husband, but I didn't really want to continue living in the United States. Uh -huh. So I really wanted to go back to Europe. And we applied, my husband was a teacher. And so he applied for a job in France. Mm -hmm. And they were like, no, 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 we do not want you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is how they said it. <laughs> so, Very cliche. <laughs> yes, I know, but it was so true. They were so uninterested. In contrast, the uh -huh. Japanese government was like, will you come here? Will you come to us? And so we went there for three years. And ah, my, okay. my son was born there. And then my husband went back again to the United States. We, we came back to the United States for four years so he could get his um, PhD. And then we went back to Japan. So, okay. and then we lived there, you know, for 23 years. Okay. Um, in which city were you? Um, the first time we were in this little, little, little town called Hagi, which is you know, Japan has three different main islands and uh -huh. it was in the main island, but at the very southern point and it was really okay. isolated. Uh, okay. The second time we went to Osaka, which is like the second largest city or at, no, mm -hmm. the third largest city. And then we ultimately ended up in a place called Hadano, which is like a bedroom community for Tokyo. It's about an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes away from Tokyo. And that was uh, okay. a really interesting mix of the two. Like it was still country, but we were close to Tokyo, close to Yokohama, uh -huh. close to some, uh, some beautiful um, like holiday resort areas. 
Okay, can I ask you, uh, so your husband, he was teaching there, and what about you? What did you do when you first were there for the three years? Oh, when I was there for the first three years, um, I just took individual classes, you know, like uh -huh. when, you, when you were an English speaker. So this would have been in the early 90s. This was... Yeah. You know, now there are just a ton of foreigners in in Japan. But at that time, there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. And we, like I said, we were in this isolated little place. And so you could not go to Japan and not end up teaching English. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh -huh, Somebody, yeah. like, Please teach my child English. <laughs> okay. And then you're sort of teaching them as well. So that yeah. was what I mainly did. And then uh -huh. like said, we decided to have our our first child there and so mm -hmm. then you know for uh the remaining time I was I was a mom yeah I mean absolutely because it takes uh, it's a lot of work <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah and and how old was your uh child when you moved back to the United States 18 months 18 months okay so it was almost like half time oh, like like for he was there for like the half of the time yes yeah for uh -huh. first time our first time there was three years and yeah so we and we came back after 18 months and he was a cute little thing like you know we I remember holding him at a grocery store and you know the Japanese when they speak they often nod their heads in agreement mm -hmm. there was my son like yeah. <laughs> okay like, what head? what's wrong with him <laughs> <laughs> <He's> Japanese <laughs> Were you, though, nervous being pregnant in a foreign country at that time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It was so different. Because then when my husband came back for his PhD, that was when I had my daughter. And so I actually have the two experiences to compare. And sure, I was I was really nervous because, um, you know, our Japanese was terrible. And the doctor's Japanese was great but his english was but you know i don't want to say pathetic that was that would be the wrong word. okay he <laughs> did get Not very it. little <laughs> it was yeah. very little yeah yeah and there were some people who i had a midwife and she didn't speak any english um i don't know like somehow we just managed <laughs> okay yeah in hindsight i'm like what was i thinking <laughs> It work. How did you communicate? Like with hands and feet or well, my son is almost 30 years old, so uh -huh. you're really tapping into that. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. It's like okay, sorry. That is yeah. too long ago. I understand. I really uh, don't remember that well how we communicated, but but the terrible thing is he he ended up being um premature by six weeks. And mm. that was where up until that point, it didn't matter. You know, like I had a book, all you needed to know about um, being pregnant or something like that. So mm -hmm. I had educated myself in English, what to expect. Um, I knew, you know, we could see what the different measurements are, like the heartbeats and the, um, I don't even know what else, but when he was premature, that was difficult because then he had to go into the hospital. Um, you know, there's all kind. he was uh, underweight. So we had to go into an incubator. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feed him, but the, to breastfeed him. But at that time, if he was in an incubator, he was not allowed to be breastfed. I wasn't, mm -hmm. I, I didn't hold him until he was like two weeks old. Yeah. Um, so there were all kinds of differences in that respect that. Yeah. Again, in hindsight, um, you know, we, I don't know if, if, if we had known, maybe we wouldn't have done it, but. But how can you know? But you can't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. well, all right. Um, but then moving forward a little bit, when your husband decided to move, move you guys back to the United States, was it immediately that you wanted to move back to Japan or did that just come up? later uh, no it was um so all we knew was that he would go back and get his phd um mm -hmm. and after that we didn't really know what to expect again 
we expected that because he got his degree in linguistics. So we expected uh-huh. that it would be something to do with, you know, teaching, teaching English as a second language. And then just, you know, another opportunity came up almost as soon as he graduated. So oh, okay. I was like, okay, let's go back to Japan. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So it was not like, hey, we have to move back to Japan. Let's uh, try everything in our power to go there. It was just by chance. Just, well, I don't know if by chance. I mean, you know, he had developed some connections and we mm, yeah. therefore had some connections. So it was a more natural progression than sure. I think just chance but yeah. um you know both of us are are in general pretty open-minded about and pretty good about opening doors and maybe just walking through doors that are open for us mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was um he had a chance to teach at a really great university in Japan and it was a four-year contract and we we're mm-hmm. like okay let's just try it again for another four years And sure. like almost every person, if you talk to any person, and I had listened to your um, podcast with another person who lived on the Southern Island in Japan, and uh-huh. I'm pretty sure he said the same thing. You come for a year or two and you stay for 20. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that. That's right. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Did you um, fall in love with Japanese culture or why... Why was it so easy to just stay there for so long? Hmm, that's a really good question. Fall in love. Fall in love is not how I would put it. I, mm-hmm. If I were to say fall in love, I would say that I fell in love with Europe. Okay. Because a lot of times when you think about falling in love, it's, it's you know, kind of immediate. It's, it's almost a little bit superficial. Mm-hmm. It's not fully informed. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, have some experiences and they're all really pleasant. Um, but the thing about with Japan was we we liked it from the get go. We were we were so enamored by the differences between you know our culture and the Japanese culture. But then we were just in it for so long, and so it's almost like a long term relationship. You know, mm-hmm. like you. You meet somebody. I mean, this is how I met my husband. I, when I think about it, it's the same thing. Like, I didn't fall in love with my husband. We met. We were friends. And then it just kind of slowly developed. And we're like, hey, we love each other. <laughs> hey, yeah. let's get married. <laughs> and we were 30 years into it. And I kind of feel that Japan was the same way. You know, uh-huh. like, we liked it. We were interested. There were interesting things. And then the longer we were there the more acclimated we became to it mm-hmm. and the more intimate we became with the culture and, and knowledgeable of it so that it kind of seeped into us a little uh-huh. bit. Okay. And were you then also an English teacher at that time when you came back? or? Mm. Well, that was a big change for me because – When we went back the second time after my husband had his PhD and mm-hmm. he went and taught at a university, um, at that time, then we had two small children. Mm, and yeah. I had been, while in the United States, I had my career. I was, I was in um, marketing and PR and writing. Mm-hmm. And I had done that for a museum, which I absolutely adored. Oh, yeah. That sounds I very interesting. It for um, county government. And I just loved that job so much. Uh-huh. And then we went to Japan, so I, I lost my job. You know, I had, mm-hmm. and then I just became a full time mother. Mm-hmm. And then I did have an opportunity to teach kindergarten children. Okay. Um, but, you know, like, to be honest, that was a really depressing, like, like clinically depressing yeah. for me. Because <laughs> I had gone from being in charge of these, this career to singing, you know, like the hello song yeah 25 times a day and I would yeah. wake up at night, and then I would go home after teaching kindergarten children to my own small children right. so it was just that part but once I quit that and started just kind of not like you know being a mother and just mm-hmm. a mother and and doing the things that 
you know, when the kids started to go to school, I had a little bit of free time to do my own things as well. And, you know, yeah. once that happened, then I found a balance. And that was when I was able to start making my own friends and start being involved in the community and, you know, start having activities and things that I found um, satisfying in a different way than just yeah. motherhood. That makes sense to me. Yeah. How did you then end up making friends? Do you remember that in the beginning? That's also a really interesting question because at first we were in Osaka, which was a big city. And mm. Osaka and Tokyo are known for being almost polar opposites where uh, okay. people in Osaka are like really outgoing and friendly and talkative and people in Tokyo, not so much. Mm. Um, so when my daughter started going to kindergarten, you know, I was able to meet some other mothers there. Sure. And by that time I had a little bit of Japanese under my belt. And so I went and I took some flower arranging classes, which is called Ikebano, like the Japanese flower arranging. So mm -hmm. by just becoming part of the community, by just kind of, even if it was only minimal communication, <laughs> yeah. it was some communication. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that, was, that, that was part of it. Uh -huh. Were your um, friends then mostly Japanese or did you also find friends who were from other countries around the world? In Osaka, it was purely Japanese. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and then when we moved to Hadano, closer to Tokyo, there were uh -huh. a lot more foreigners around. Yeah. And, and I ended up having a huge, a huge community of both Japanese and um, foreign friends. Yeah. Yeah, because you said in the beginning... There were not a lot of English speakers when you first came, but then that was already seven, eight years later. So the, did that change then as well a little bit? Well, the first time, you know, the... You were also isolated. Yeah, it was... Yeah. We were, we were some of the first foreigners to even go to that town. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, the, when we lived there, there were... One, two, three other foreigners with us. Like they uh -huh. taught at different schools. And I don't think we were the first group, but we might've been the second group okay. who had been there. So really it was just such a, um, we, I mean, we were like exotic animals. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were famous, right? <laughs> we were. Oh my God, we were. Everybody knew who. And sometimes like, I remember seeing this one man, I was walking on the sidewalk And I don't know why I happened to just look over and there was this man, like, as he was driving by, I'm like, look at the road, look at the road. <laughs> we had never seen a foreign person before. Oh, that is crazy. But, you know, I also had another um, episode about an English teacher. He was a teacher in Japan for a while as well. And he said, like, he got really sick of it or he was like, not sick, but tired of it. Yeah. because everybody knew him and like he go into the store and says like oh there is teacher eric hi teacher eric everybody knew him by his name that is so true i had people ask me for my autograph oh really <laughs> <laughs> they thought you were like a rock star <laughs> exactly exactly and coming it's kind of interesting because i grew up in this really small town And I always had this desire to leave. And I never really understood why. But, you know, as an adult now, I think that it's because as a small town, everybody knew you. Everybody mm -hmm. knew, you know, what you were doing. Like, I would, I would be downtown. And by the time I got to my home, my mother would already know what I had done with my friends because, you know, so many people had called her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Soggy was a little bit like that. And... And yet it was really fascinating because um, we were foreigners and, and maybe mm -hmm. because we had, you know, I was 30 at that time, I guess, 30 something, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that, you know, being a teenager or a young woman and being a approaching middle aged woman, you know, offered a completely different perspective about that. Yeah, 100% for sure. But I also grew up in a very small town and I always referred to this as well. Like, I'm like 
don't want anybody to know everything what I'm doing. But I never thought about it that this could have anything to do for me moving away. <laughs> right, right. And yet probably it really did. And you just Maybe. hadn't really realized I it. mean, I always said, like, I'm going to move away to a bigger city where not everybody knows me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I didn't have in mind back then when I was 15 to just move far, far away. Right, right. Yeah. So in the beginning, when you moved there, you probably like missed some things. But did you notice then the later you were there that you did not miss things anymore? Oh, sure. Like products or things? No. The, I mean, again, because I had lived abroad for most of my adult life. Ah, uh, okay. I, I didn't have the same cultural draw to my home that my mm -hmm. husband did. Um, okay. The only thing that I really, really missed was shoes. Shoes? <laughs> because, yeah, because <laughs> I'm five foot ten. And like, <laughs> I have a size... 10 size 11 feet and in okay. japan you can't get shoes if you're a woman over the size of eight sure. yes and how what did you do then i mean because that was before the internet yeah oh that, well i when i had we would come back because of the kids we would come back every year to visit the grandparents mm. and so i would just i would come home with new shoes and so clothes stuck up, clothes stuck up in shoes for the whole year uh, yeah <laughs> It sounds crazy, but I would. Sometimes I would just buy like two or three pairs of the same shoes, just no, because you walk everywhere in Japan. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, like I, I had, at first I, I went for the fashion shoes, like the shoes that I just loved. And then I realized, oh my God, I can't walk in these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you have a real problem. <laughs> right. So I had this, I had this like whole rack of beautiful shoes that I could never use. And then I would just bring, you know, two or three pairs of really good walking shoes every time. Um, I went okay. Back. Well, you learned. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how about learning the language? So, um, so how was, how was your approach learning the language and getting by? We, <laughs> even though we were there for 26 years, We never actually expected to be there that long. Uh -huh. So we never took lessons. Oh, okay. Um, when we were in in Hagi the first time, mm -hmm. we did, there were like some community lessons for the foreign teachers. So we did mm -hmm. um, take some of those. But literally, Japan has studied language and spoken language. Mm -hmm. And they are so different. So we were learning like the emperor's language. Oh. <laughs> okay. And then we would go out and try to use it and be, people would be like, what? <laughs> so you talk like a... Yeah. Like, like, you. <laughs> so we would never hear the things that we were studying. Um, and so really the best way, we just learned it by listening, which therefore took a lot longer than if we mm -hmm. had sat down and studied it. Yeah. Um, and then also because we were in the English speaking world, you know, everybody right. who speaks to us wants to speak English. Uh -huh. They see it as a chance to like practice sure. their English. So it became a real, um, issue at some point like we just i mean eventually we just found friends who don't speak english yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but then you're so limited the kinds of things that you can do together yeah uh-huh yeah so and and do you remember how long it took you to feel more comfortable speaking japanese well i would actually say i'm still not a hundred percent comfortable uh, okay depends. like eventually I I learned yoga and I and I started teaching yoga to people and so at that time it, I was I was encountering people who just didn't speak any English whatsoever uh -huh. and so at that time I really noticed a huge difference in you know what I could how I could speak to people and what I could say uh -huh. and, and the funny thing is you know like I would have these 
really like I could tell you the names of bones in Japanese. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My husband and I were out at a restaurant and they used a different way for asking us if we want cold water. And we're like, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like it, it really depended on like there would be times when I could speak fluently with somebody and then the topic would change. And if I didn't have that vocabulary, I wouldn't know anything. And okay. like the cold water example, you know, people there, there's, we could say, we could ask for cold water, but somebody used a different word that we had not heard before at the restaurant. And you were and lost. But we're like, what'd she say? I don't know. What'd she say? I don't know. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Makes sense. And what about, but what about your kids? Oh, they are a hundred percent fluent. We, we made certain to put them in Japanese public school uh -huh. because the first time when we went to Osaka, we wanted, they were just little and we wanted them to have friends in the community. Uh -huh. So we put them in the school and within a year, you know, they were both like speaking pretty easily And then mm -hmm. within two or three years, they were fluent. And okay. at one point we had um, the neighbors across the street from us. They didn't speak any English. Okay. And they were over at our house. And we were, we were sitting at a table, four of us. We were facing into the living room where we, my husband and I could see the children. But the people who were over, their children were here, were with us. But they're uh -huh. back to them. And the, one of the mothers said, If it weren't for the fact that I knew my son's voice, I wouldn't be able to tell who was mm. the foreign child and who was the native child. Okay. So, you know, they picked it up at that age just like that. So, so quick. And yes. the, the funny story is, it's a little bit embarrassing. When we went there the second time, you know, because my husband and I had been there, so we knew mm -hmm. a little bit of Japanese. And so we would be able to speak a little bit of Japanese. And my kids were like, oh, Whoa, mom and dad, you can <laughs> speak Japanese. You're so cool. <laughs> and then after like one year, they were like, Mom, don't say anything. <laughs> you were so embarrassing. Oh, wow. yes, You're yes, saying yes, it all wrong. <laughs> exactly. Mom, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I feel like that. <laughs> yeah. But um, did your kids speak to you in Japanese sometimes too? And you just no, no, no. no. It was it was all English at our house because my husband and I are both uh, English speakers, and so yeah. um, they they would speak to each other when they didn't want us to know what was going on, or sometimes maybe just for because that was sure. the natural language speaking with other children. Yeah. Oh, now I'm just asking because my son, he only talks English to us because my husband is also German and we only talk German in the house. And my daughter, the older one, she speaks to us in German. Mm -hmm. But the younger one, he doesn't talk any German. I mean, he understands. He understands yeah. everything, but he just responds in English. That's really interesting because I've heard about that. From people who are in mixed marriages, where you'll have like a, a an English speaker and a Japanese speaker together, mm -hmm. and and you know they'll hear both languages at home, and then the children will choose which one is more comfortable for them. Yeah, um, but I haven't heard it in that situation where you're both German speakers and you speak German at home. Yeah, I think I mean also um, I think well he goes to daycare, so this is in English, mm. and. Well, many times when he talks to me in English, then I answer him in English. It's just because I'm just so used to it that if somebody okay. talks to me in English, I don't answer in German, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But then I always like, have to catch myself and then talk to him in, in German. But I don't know. Like every summer when we visit our, fr our family, then his German comes back more. Uh -huh. But Once we are back here, he'll lose it. But he is so little. Who knows what it will be when he will grow yeah. a little bit more. Well, one of the things that we did notice, my son lived in the United States 
for those four years. Yeah. And so his English was used, you know, outside of the house as well. My daughter, she was two and a half when we moved back. Mm -hmm. And so all of her life, basically, she was in Japan. Mm -hmm. She understood, like your son, she understood English perfectly. But she did have more difficulty reading and expressing herself mm -hmm. than my son ever did. And okay. when it came to high school, the high school system in Japan is, is very competitive. And, and we had a little bit of a difficulty with that. So we ended up homeschooling her for her high school years. Mm, okay. And that just made all the difference. She really struggled at first because her reading ability was not so good. Her, like I said, her, her ability to express herself. She mm -hmm. had complicated things that she wanted to say, but she didn't yeah. really know how to get it through in English. And then mm -hmm. by, by doing this um, homeschooling, she, it took her five years instead of four, um, which okay. was what the curriculum was. But that's yeah. because the first year really was her kind of getting up to her like, academic skills that other kids who spoke English took for granted. So right. now that you now that you mentioned that, um, it, I'd kind of forgotten about that. But it, I actually see a parallel between, um, you know, my daughter and her ability to express herself in English, and you know, maybe your mm -hmm. son and his German. Yeah. Well, we'll see how how it will continue. Well, uh, one thing that we did was we did let them watch TV because we figured that would give them. Like I, I grew up not really watching TV. My husband mm -hmm. grew up not watching TV. And I, I feel like that's why we love to read so much. But television was an area where they could, you know, be exposed to English in situations right. that were outside of like the household conversation. Uh, so sure. And then maybe learn some other vocabularies that you mm -hmm. usually don't use. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And you said that, earlier just to change topics a little bit again um and then uh, you visited home like once a year like home back to the united states yes because uh, the grandparents wanted you know to see their yeah <laughs> yeah did they come visit you as well sometimes um my mother-in-law lived there for a short time she was also a teacher mm, and then okay. my mother visited Twice, I think. Okay, yeah. twice. Mm -hmm. And even though you were there for such a long time, was there anything that was hard for you to get used to? No, not there. To be honest, coming back to... The oh, United yeah. States, that's, that's a harder transition for that's me. That's a harder transition? Okay, and why do you think is that? You know, I had lived in a bunch of different places before. And, you know, I, I've lived in... Australia, South Africa, and then a couple of different places in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I mean, I, I like, I like going someplace where I don't know, learning the place, learning, meeting people, learning the language, you know, so you get like kind of into this routine, I guess, about this yeah. is what you do when you go to a new place. But when I came back to the United States, um, you know, there are expectations of me here. I... I don't have a sense of community. And yet, you know, when mm -hmm. you're in your home country and with your home language, there's that expectation that you're going to have a community. Do you know right. What I mean? Isn't it different though? Because, I mean, you for yourself know at least that you just came back, that mm -hmm. of course you don't have like a, a big friendship circle because you were away for such a long time. Yeah. I, I, I wish... Victoria, that I had a clearer answer. Um, I think a big part of it is that here in the United States, for example, um, you know, I don't have small children, so I, I don't have mm -hmm. a school or a mother network yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. to enter into. And I also don't have work. My husband, mm -hmm. he has a job and he loves his job. And he's not necessarily as much of a social person as I am, 
but he gets social interactions just yeah. by being at work and he loves the people who he works with mm-hmm. so it's me, a lot easier for him mm-hmm. yeah it is and I don't I actually <laughs> I guess I was a bit naive I thought oh I had these great jobs 20 26 or 24 years ago <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> okay <laughs> back and get a job and and no like I not only did I not get a job I actually only like a lot of people I, I didn't even get answers to my submitted mm-hmm. resume and so yeah. I don't I don't have that community that mm-hmm. the, like the friends that I do have all came from my previous jobs when I was oh, I see uh-huh and you know so I've kind of reactivated those friendships but Mm -hmm. I don't at some point I'm starting to figure it out and I'll start getting into a community and you know going just like with the Ikebana that I did in Japan yeah like okay I'm gonna go and try this and and that then got me into a community and I could expand on that um but I don't know, coming back to a place that you're familiar with, it's just different than going mm-hmm. to a new place. It's different yeah. in so many ways, in your expectations and the expectations that other people have for you. And and I don't necessarily want to get into something and then be stuck there if that makes yeah. any sense mm-hmm. like I'm still just trying to figure out where I am where I fit in this okay new- and um so what was behind the decision then to move back to the United States um elderly parents elderly parents okay yeah. so yeah. so okay this was not even like a decision where you said like oh maybe we can wait a little bit right. longer yeah, yeah. so yeah. um Was it just a natural decision? Was it like, oh, yeah, we have to go home? Or was it like, um, maybe we can not go home and find a different way, like figure a way around it? that was our attitude for the last couple of years. Uh (laughs) Okay, yes. And then at some, and we always knew at some point we were going to have to actually make that decision. Uh, Yeah. And um, yeah, a couple years ago, you know, like it's just, when my father passed away, then my mother was by herself. My uh-huh. husband's mother has been by herself for a long time. And, you know, as they get older, it just became more and more of our life there was taken up trying to deal with things that were happening here yeah. from halfway around the world. Yeah. Like my husband, you know, would wake up every day to messages about, okay, this has to be done. And he would be trying on the phone you know and the time difference oh. is like almost exactly the opposite so we would have this window you know like he would wake up and he would have like one hour to try to do something to solve some problem here uh-huh. and it was just, at some point it was just like you know what this is just all consuming and so that was when we decided we just have to make the decision and come home okay And okay, so and besides, like you having like trouble finding a community, how else has it been? Um, culturally, there are some things that are both really good and really bad. Uh huh. I mentioned earlier that you know in Japan we just walked everywhere. We didn't have a car in Japan. We had public transportation, we walked, I had a bicycle, you know, like everything was just up to us to do something. Mm -hmm. And so if we were on the train, you know, you would go into Tokyo, we'd be able, I'd be able to get work done. If I was doing work, I'd be able to read, we would arrive just, you know, oh, here we are after this wonderful trip to Tokyo. And here it's like the exact opposite. So much time is spent in the car. And driving is, I don't know what it's like wherever you are, but here driving is, it's like playing some kind of game where you don't know if you're going to make it or not. (laughs) (laughs) I see people do the craziest things. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh On the freeway, especially. (laughs) 
Yeah. On the freeways, but even on these like small, not, not like the little two lane roads, but I have had people pass me like on the right, like on the shoulder oh. when they were, and they were, anyway, it doesn't matter. I could go into it's, details. It's too that. much, it's too much road rage. And, it's um, road rage. Yeah. And for you, you haven't driven in all this time. No, when we came back to the state, we always kept our driver's license. Ah, uh, okay. It was not like I haven't used the car in twenty years. Okay. No, <laughs> okay. No, that would be even more. That would be even more terrifying. Yeah. No, we would always drive when we came back. Oh uh, yeah. Um, okay. But but still, just the the amount of time mm -hmm. that you spend in the car, and then that time is not relaxing time. It's very stressful. Um. So that's a huge difference. Tipping, no. <laughs> I, still, I still don't know what to do about tipping. It's like every time I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And I, I mean, I'm American. I know I was a waitress. For But I think it also changed a lot since the pandemic because, um, I mean, I'm always like fine with tipping, but like now they expect you even to tip sometimes just to pay entrance or something. because there is a person mm -hmm. who's a cashier to whatever. And I'm like, it's just like the entrance fee. What have to tip for this, you know? So sometimes yeah. it's just, um, they asking at weird places to be tipped. If it's a waitress, anything to do with food service, I get it 100%, but Yeah. Now it's everywhere. I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, it's just, it's become overwhelming, you know, like a dollar here, a dollar there, you know, do you want to just round up, you know, like everybody is mm -hmm. like, there's this drain, this constant drain of just money being randomly given to people. And, you know, even in restaurants at this point, like if I sit down and somebody is physically, taking care of me. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. But I was at a restaurant the other day. I ordered takeout. I came in, <laughs> I ordered in front of the person. I waited for it. I took it and they asked for it. They wanted a tip. I mean, they didn't ask for it. It was on the little pin. It, it was on that. Yes. But, and now, I, yeah. I and now it's more. also, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and now it's also what I sometimes just find a little bit, uh, I don't even know what the word is, but like, I think it's a little bit too much if they already ask for 30% or even more, Yeah, you know, because like, I remember if it's like, if they say like 10%, 15%, mm -hmm. 20%, fine. Right. But like, sometimes it just starts at 25% and I'm like, uh, that's, that's nice. like not what I did or what I was used to. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's, and it's, And they do it for you, right? Like, it's right there. It's like, oh, 25% is this much. 30% is this much. And I'm like, okay, well, luckily, I can do math. <laughs> so yeah. I'm only going to give you 15% or, or, I mean, I usually give 20% if I'm at a restaurant. But no, yeah. absolutely right. It's, it's, it's become weird how much of a drain these things are. Like, I mean, e even in a store that, you know, is a... Uh, Like just a random retail store, they'll ask you. Oh you wow, want, yeah. You want to donate to you know? Like, oh like yeah, yeah. Babies with cancer. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah. Yes, because yourself. you feel bad if you don't do it. Right. Yeah, we had it yesterday. I had to. My daughter's um, birthday party was yesterday, so we ordered pizza from the closest chain that was by the playground. It was a Domino's, mm -hmm. and when I ordered. It was also, do you want to round up for St. Jude's? And I'm like, well, I cannot say no to <gasps> St. Jude's. Of course, I have to round up. Right, exactly. They, they, they know how to get us. And yeah, and I have to say, Victoria, I'm, I have had a little bit of an issue of tipping where I had a job, and I could see where the tip was like where somebody had had given a tip but I did not receive the tip yeah and and now I have to wonder like with some of these places like I believe restaurants and whatnot give their staff tips 
But if I'm at a grocery store and they ask, do you want to give, you know, a certain amount to this charity? Like, I don't know anymore. Like, is that like, does all of that money go to the charity or is it just some percentage? Like right, now I'm okay. starting to question mm. because it's so frequent. And because the things that they say are like really tearing at your heartstrings, like I'm like, is this is this bona fide? <laughs> um, I mean, I think I mean that that's what I'm thinking. If it's like a big chain, I think they cannot just lie about it, because I mean they would just ruin their reputation. Yeah, I I don't know. I want to look into it, but I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else besides tipping that um, they, it's hard for you to get used to now? I I don't know if. I, I don't want to only say the bad thing. So I want yeah. I want to say one of the other good things about the United mm -hmm. States is every time I've come here and I've, I noticed it way back in the eighties when I first came back from Australia and that is just the diversity of people. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you, when, when you come just as soon as you get off the airplane and you come into the airport, there's, there's just, diversity of people and languages and clothing styles and mm -hmm. I mean like in Australia you know I noticed it at first because when I would come into LA uh it's like oh wow right I'd forgotten <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then in Japan you know it's it's another you know pretty homogenous society mm -hmm. and so like er Coming from those two places into America, I think coming uh -huh. from Europe, it's not so much because Europe now is so diverse as well. But whenever I came back from Japan, I would just, I would notice it and I would love hearing, you know, just all the languages and, okay. and just seeing this diversity of people. And I never get tired of that. When, when I, I actually volunteered for a political organization and I was in charge of the database when I was in Japan. And mm -hmm. You know, you go through a list of people in the United States and literally, and I mean like that word literally, <laughs> Yeah, there are people and there are names from every part, every country and every ethnicity in, in our country. And that is uh -huh. really like, for me, that is a really positive thing. I, I think that's what makes our country strong. I think that's what makes our country special. Uh -huh. Um, and, and I celebrate that whenever I would mm -hmm. come back. That's and, nice. And even now, you know, like just, just, you know, walking around, even in my little town where, I mean, I'm in Delaware, Delaware is hardly, you know, like the magnet for immigrants. And yet, even so, <laughs> I see so many people of, you know, different backgrounds. It's really nice. But, I have I can say something to that because like we used to live um in the Bay Area and in San Francisco and Oakland and I always said that also it's like I enjoy that there is such a big multicultural scene here that people are from everywhere and then we moved to Austin Texas and then I was like there are only white people here wow oh, really? <laughs> you know but I mean it's but I mean it's not really true there are also There's a big Hispanic community mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. but it was just in the neighborhood that we lived in. I didn't feel anything. And also it was in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was just like white and blonde people. Mm -hmm. So I was mm -hmm. like, I miss it. Yeah. And then I was actually very happy that my daughter went to the ESL program in school because then she was also in a class with kids from all over the world mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was really nice yeah that's really interesting to hear because you know I know that Austin is a liberal city and uh -huh. and so I I would not have expected that it was also still you know less I mean, diverse yeah no for, no you have um, also a more diverse it was probably because of that neighborhood that we were in yeah yeah um and because of pandemic but i mean for sure you have such a big hispanic 
um, population here and black population as well. And I feel like where we are now, I don't feel it as much, but there apparently there are a lot of Asians here as well. Not couldn't say that though. I couldn't confirm that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, I guess where I live, it's a little bit of a college town. I don't live right in mm. the college town, but I guess close enough that, you know, just going shopping, just going to the library, just even just mm -hmm. walking around. Um, you know, I, I see, I see a lot of Muslims. I see a lot of people wearing the mm -hmm. um, hijab, I guess it's called. And mm -hmm. you know, I hear Spanish everywhere, which is yeah. so good because I'm trying yeah. to study Spanish. So I can just hear it, you know, like just around me. It's like, oh, I understood that word. Oh, yeah. I understood that sentence. You know, and that's one of the things to learn a language. You have to be able to hear yeah. it spoken. Yeah, I, yeah, I always think it's a, it's a shame that not every school teaches Spanish at the same time. No, and I think, I mean, here it is only if um, a certain percentage of the, whatever the families in that circle of the school are Spanish speakers then they mm. offer it mm. but for our little school there is nothing the next school is mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah well you get yeah. to hear it in the community too and and you'll have I mean you can have yeah you can have a way of learning it I guess without having to take it in the classroom yeah yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. um is there anything from Japan that you miss um the oddest thing is I miss ramen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> is the one you had here not good? Mm -mm. You know, They're not comparable. It, it, it's good enough, but uh -huh. it's, uh, you know, ramen is just everywhere in Japan. And, and you just, I feel like I'm a little bit late to the party, so to speak. You know, like I, okay. I love ramen, but I went for a long time without any you know specialty ramens I, we would just eat ramen if it just happened to be you know something around and we were hungry but yeah then, you know i guess in the last five six years we started seeking out ramen from different places and it really it's really good and 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 i i miss it um and of course you know like you can't live somewhere for 26 well in this case we lived in that little town for about 15 years uh-huh but that's a long time Yeah, and you know, so I I miss my my friends. I miss I miss my free time as well. Mm, okay. Here, I mean, I I know it sounds crazy because I was just saying about how I don't have a job or anything, and yet somehow I'm always busy. Part of it is because so much time is spent traveling in a car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I miss my friends. I miss the community. Like we had. I had, by the time I left, you know, I had this community around me and we, we, we did events together and like the, the, the two months before I left, we had gotten together and we had, there was this, uh, there were these big walls along the river where that ran through our town. And so we, we got permission from the city to paint pictures on that wall. Mm -hmm you know, of birds and plants and, and like, like Mount Fuji, for example, because we could see Mount mm -hmm. Fuji from the town where we were. And, yeah. and, you know, there were like about, I don't know, 30 or 40 of us who worked on that project. Um, yeah. So those kinds of things. Yeah. I, I miss, and I just, this is the last thing I'll tell you about this. I'll, I miss the kindness in a way. And I, I don't mean to say that Americans aren't kind because of, of course they are, but it, I guess it goes along with the driving that I was saying. Like I, I feel all the time um, that Americans are a little bit on edge, you know, like people mm. aren't always kind to you. And, you know, like I, I see people like if, if they, if somebody takes too long at the light and I'm not talking about me because I, I don't take too long at the light. <laughs> <laughs> But if somebody does, you know, like the person behind, beep, 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 beep. It's like, whoa, just hold on. They're on their way. Or, you know, yeah. people are, people, I feel like the t-shirts. I see these t-shirts that have really offensive things on them that are kind of like designed 
specifically it seems to like trigger someone yeah okay and and those kind of things I'm like that's no I don't I don't feel comfortable with that I feel a little bit um like what why what's the purpose to that Mm, I uh, I mean I always think Americans are very friendly but but you're right like I think maybe inside of them they're like very on edge as you said Okay, so I have another question, kind of. So since you just moved back, and I know the having vacation in the U.S. is like so, or you don't have a lot of paid days. Um, do you go back to Japan then, if you have like the time, or do you want to go somewhere else? Yeah, that's a. My son is there. Um, uh huh. Okay, your son yeah, is there. Uh-huh. My son and his wife are in Tokyo. Um, and mm-hmm. we were we were going to go back this um, summer, and we looked at the prices, and um, we just can't afford it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how much that is from you know like the airline industry still recovering from the pandemic. So you know perhaps in another year or so that will be different. But mm-hmm. yeah, we I do I do want to go back. Um, of course, to see my my son, but also like I just I I I just want to see Japan again, you know. Like I mean, yeah. it, was, it was our home. We had two homes when I was in Japan. I would talk about you know home in America. Mm-hmm. And now yep. that I'm in America. I talk about home in Japan, and, mm-hmm. and you know you can't live somewhere for that long without without it becoming part of you. And yeah. you know, so then when you tear away from that, you know, it's almost, I guess, like losing a limb, like you still, you still feel it in some way. Mm-hmm. It still draws your attention in some way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I would live when I would live somewhere for so long and then go back a short time after, like how I would feel just visiting it and knowing I'll don't stay here anymore or I don't live here anymore that's exactly right because as I said we came here regularly as a visitor to visit to see family to see friends Mm. but when you have that limited time you know you're crazy busy you're always going to see somebody else yeah going to do something like the time flies by you have a full plate and then you go back Mm -hmm. to your life And, you know, and in this case, it's, it's not limited. And I think that's probably what makes it as, you know, as a little, it it makes it a little different to adjust to because you're not a visitor. You have to find a life again. Yeah. It entails, I mean, it took us, you know, 24 years to find a life in Japan. And like, you can't, and I think that partly that's my, that's on me, you know, thinking, well, I've been here for a year. Where's my community? What, what's my purpose for mm-hmm. being here? You know, like I'm putting that yeah. on me. But I mean, when you think about it, most people don't have to do that. And you don't have the culture shock, the reverse culture shock as well to deal with. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that takes time. But it also evolves, you know, it's, it's not yeah. just like, oh, okay, this is going to be what I do now. No, I know. It takes time for sure. I mean, that's also like a reason why I do the podcast because I was also like, I just cannot be just a uh, stay at home mom and only do that and wonder what else can I, could I do, but not do. So I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna do the podcast. And at least I have like, um, creative outcome or like a purpose right kinda. that's so you know true. yeah that's that is and it's little things like that like when you started that yeah. podcast you didn't even know probably the role that it would play it would be just like hmm, I think I'll do a podcast to see yeah exactly like, explore that and now it's like probably really yeah part of you <laughs> exactly and it uh, And it feels like work, you know, so it feels like, hey, I really have to do this. Like I have a timeline Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no pressure, only if it comes from me. I don't have a boss or anything. But, mm-hmm. like, still, like, for me, this is important. This mm-hmm. is work. Mm-hmm. So, and I enjoy it. So, my days or my weeks feel a lot better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or like, yeah, so it's it's good for, for myself, yeah. And it's good to hear the experiences from people who are in the same situation as you. You, you, yeah. you both hear... The similarities that they have that you mm-hmm. have but also the differences and you and you hear how you know they coped with it and and that's really yeah. therapeutic in a way even if you don't yeah need it to be therapeutic <laughs> yeah exactly but I mean I remember like I was venting to like the other mothers you know who are all like Americans and and they I don't think they could understand me because I was like I want to work, but I cannot work because at this moment, I don't have a work authorization. Yeah. You know, I'm waiting for it. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I, okay. okay. <laughs> so, you know, they could not really understand where I was coming from. Right. But so this is nice that other people are in a similar boat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is therapeutic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, okay. But before we leave, I also wanted to talk about your podcast. Oh my wonder! I love my podcast so much. I love my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is it called, and what is it about? It's called the Kaidan Kai, and it is where I read uh, ghost stories and supernatural stories out loud. And uh-huh. it's a little different. Like if you look at a lot of the ghost story podcasts, um, most of them are classic ghost stories stories that are in the public domain but mine Mm -hmm. are from modern writers you know from all over the world I get them from India from Australia I just recently did one from Romania I think it is and I love it and it I started it during the pandemic just for something to do Uh uh-huh and then it, it was based on the idea of uh kind of the equivalent of the Japanese version of campfire stories. Nice. So the idea nice. is like, if you, if you've ever been to a campfire, you know, like all these people will tell stories and each story is a little different. It's different themes, different story styles, different, you know, sometimes they're goofy. Sometimes they're really scary. And that's the uh-huh. idea behind this as well. You know, like when you ghost stories are, like they they can be told in any genre and the kaidan kai i'm pretty sure has most of those genres <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. uh are they fiction or is it just people's experiences no or is it both it's all fiction it's um, okay yeah because there are a lot of true story paranormal podcasts uh-huh. um, and i i just want fiction stories okay mm-hmm. all right okay so everyone has to check it out i will put the link on this in the show notes oh yeah and when i publish this podcast episode i will also put a link on it in on instagram <laughs> thank you that's great that yeah great. for sure yeah okay i think we're getting to an end of this episode um thank you very much for taking your time no sorry i said this wrong Thank you very much for for taking time to be on here. Oh, it was my pleasure. I'm so happy to talk with you about that. Um, you know, I, I listen to your podcast. I Not not every single week, I'm afraid, but yeah, I have listened to you. several of them. And that's why I said how interesting it is to know um, other people who have you know, been in these same situations and hear, yeah. hear their experiences. So thank you for doing yeah. it. It's really a, a nice podcast. That's very helpful, I think. Thank you. Yes, that was Linda's story. And she already gave such a nice ending to the podcast. So I feel I don't need to add anything more except of to check out her podcast, The Kite on Kite. And you will find the info in the show notes or just search for it uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. And then something that I always mention. So if you 
would like to be a guest on this podcast, then why don't you reach out to me at worldscollide123pod at gmail.com and send me a quick message. Or you can also do the same at Instagram or threads or TikTok. I would be happy to have you on the show. I'm always looking for guests. Okay, until then, I hope you tune in again next week. Until then, bye. Oh, and don't forget to tell everyone about this podcast if you like it. Bye.